Hey everyone, welcome to KSSP Podcast. I'm Spencer. And I'm Katie. And we are going to discuss wage slavery. So what is wage slavery? One definition says it is a dependence on wages or salary for your livelihood, especially when wages are low, treatment conditions are poor, and there are few chances of upward mobility. And with wage slavery, we felt it was important to discuss how it could affect us. So with that, we're going to be going over some facts and statistics to determine if American citizens are in fact wage slaves. And what can be done about it? Um, We're going to go over lower cost of living, UBI, and Medicare for all. So how do we define wage slavery? Well, it can be defined as a person's dependence on wages or a slavery for their livelihood, especially when wages are low, treatment conditions are poor, and there are few chances of upward mobility. Other important factors to consider include a lack of worker self-management, lack of fulfilling job choices, and lack of leisure in an economy. So, with wage slavery, not only do you work with low pay and potentially horrendous conditions, but also don't have enjoyment outside of work, partly due to the low wage. So, you may be thinking that they aren't slaves if they have the freedom to choose the jobs they want to work. Well, it's not easy or accessible for people to choose what job they work or where they work. It can be difficult for many people to quit their current job or to look for a new job due to the threat of poverty, starvation, loss of health care, and it can also be hard to find a job if you have a past history with a criminal record, but life is full of a lot of hardships that these that people face. These hardships shouldn't be a barrier to work, not to mention potential different educational requirements or previous experience that other higher paying jobs may require. And then there's also the factor of time. Well, if they feel they are a wage slave, then they should just ask for higher pay, right? Well, unfortunately, there is unequal bargaining power between the laborer and the ownership slash capitalist class. So to give us more of an idea of wage slavery, let's briefly go over wage slavery in the past and what people thought of it back in the day. So the concept of wage slavery dates back to the ancient world. In ancient Rome, Caesarea wrote that the very wage wage laborers receive is a pledge of their slavery. And in 1763, French journalist Simone Linguet gave an influential description of wage slavery. The slave was precious to his master because of the money he had cost him. They were worth at least as much as they could be sold for in the market. It is impossibility of living by any other means that compels our farm laborers to till the soil whose fruits they will not eat and our masons to construct buildings in which they will not live. It is want that compels them to go down on their knees to the rich man in order to get from him permission to enrich him. What effective game has the suppression of slavery brought him? He is free, you say. Ah, then his misfortune, these men have the most terrible, the most imperious of masters that is need. They must therefore find someone to hire them or die of hunger. Is that to be free? So basically saying workers are motivated to work these low paying jobs or, you know, within slavery because the little that they gain is better than gaining nothing. And then we'll kind of go over different people who compared it to slavery as well. So there were proponents of it being compared to slavery and opponents. Now, either side may have had some ulterior motives, which would basically be the reasoning for why they were proponents or opponents of against it or for it but we're just gonna read some of their different quotes from both sides so we're gonna start with the proponents who believed in wage slavery so southern slave states argued that northern workers were free but in name the slaves of endless toil and that their slaves were better off corroborated by some modern studies that indicate slaves' material conditions in the 19th century were better than what was typically available to free urban laborers at the time. 
Henry David Thoreau wrote, It is hard to have a southern overseer. It is worse to have a northern one. But worst of all, when you are the slave driver of yourself. Imagery of wage slavery was widely used by labor organizations during the mid-19th century to object to the lack of worker self-management. However, it was gradually replaced by the more neutral term, wage work, towards the end of the 19th century as labor organizations shifted their focus to raising wages. Karl Marx described capitalist society as infringing on individual autonomy due to being based on a materialistic and commodified concept of the body and its liberty. And Frederick Engels stated, The slave is sold once and for all. The proletarian must sell himself daily and hourly. The individual slave, property of one master, is assured in existence, however miserable it may be, because of the master's interest. The individual proletarian, property as it were of the entire bourgeois, bourgeois. bourgeois class, which buys his labor only when someone has need of it, has no secure existence. So now we'll look at the opponents of the term wage slavery. So abolitionists criticize the analogy. They argue that wage workers were neither wronged nor oppressed. Abraham Lincoln and Republicans argue that the condition of wage workers was different from slavery, as long as laborers were likely to develop the opportunity to work for themselves, achieving self-employment. Frederick Douglass, an abolitionist and former slave, initially declared, now I am my own master. Later in life, he concluded to the contrary, saying, experience demonstrates that there may be a slavery of wages only a little less galling and crushing in its effects than chattel slavery, and that the slavery of wages must go down with the other. He went on to speak about these conditions as arising from the unequal bargaining power between the ownership capitalist class and the non-ownership laborer class. No more crafty and effective device for defrauding the Southern laborers could be adopted than the one that substitutes orders upon shopkeepers for currency and payment of wages. It has the merit of a show of honesty, while it puts the laborer completely at the mercy of the landowner and the shopkeeper. So in 1869, the NYT described wage labor as a system of slavery as absolute, if not as degrading as that which lately prevailed at the South. E.P. Thompson stated, gap in status between a servant and a hired wage laborer subject to the orders and discipline of the master and an artisan who might come and go as he pleased was wide enough for men to shed blood rather than allow themselves to be pushed from one side to the other. And in the value system of the community, those who resisted degradation were in the right. So, as we can see, wage slavery, the concept thereof, has been around for a while, but does it still exist? There's no way in the modern world any form of slavery could still exist, right? First, we'll go over why salary and wages are important. So, salary and wages are important because they are the main source of income used to cover cost of living. Being as salary and wages are the main sources of income for most Americans, we would hope they would lead to economic well-being. What is economic well-being? Economic well-being can be defined as working people having the means to support themselves. So, if we wanted to make the claim that Americans don't experience wage slavery, we'd hope to see that Americans are able to support themselves economically from their wages or salary. Well, let's take a look. First, let's look at minimum wage. The minimum wage was created in 1938. Since its creation, Congress has raised it nine times. The current federal minimum wage in the United States is $7.25 an hour. Currently, there are 30 states and Washington, D.C. who have minimum wages above the federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour. Now let's look at some stats on income. Gonna adjust here. <laughs> All right. First, we'll look at this article, uh, 25 Essential Average American Income Statistics from Zipia. So let's see. The average personal income in the U.S. is $63,214. The median income in the U.S. is 
$44,225. The average American annual real wage was $67,521 in 2020. I don't know what the real wage is. I don't know what that means, but I think that's something significant. Um, the average U.S. household income is $87,864. The median U.S. household income is $61,937. So about 38% of Americans make under $50,000 a year. And then the rest make over 50000 So in the United States, the average woman earns a median income of $42,238, while her male counterpart earns $52,004. That's around an $8,000 difference. So here are the U.S. median income by gender. And as we can see, men make more than women in all of these sectors. However, even in similar fields with similar qualifications, women earn 84% of what men earn. There's a huge gap between male and female business owners, with men earning 40% more than their female counterparts. In 1979, the average woman earned only 61.5% of a man's weekly earnings. But that was in 1979. So Asian Americans earn the highest median income of $87,243. And then it looks like black people make uh, an average of $41,500,000. Or sorry, $41,500. And then we can look, just look at the chart here for a second. Maybe pause it if you need to. Those between the ages of 45 to 54 earn the highest incomes at a median of $84,464. So this is the U.S. median income by age. So it looks like a bell curve here, honestly. Yeah. Those between 15 to 24 earn the lowest incomes at a median of only $43,531. Men who work for the federal government have the highest median income of any sector at $68,464. Women who work for the private sector have the lowest median income at $30,040. That's over $11,000 less than their male counterparts and at least $7,000 less than women in any other sector. Okay, so real wage is a, when adjusted for inflation and the number of goods and services that can actually be bought. We get an individual's real wage. Mm -hmm. So this is adjusted for everything. So from 1964 to 2018, the average American's real wage has only increased by $2.38. So when adjusted for inflation, the wage of 250 in 1964 would equate to $20.27. Meanwhile, the average wage of 2018 was $22.65. So as of 2020, the average American real wage is $67,521. And that's actually slightly lower than the average real wage in 2019, which was $69,560. So here are real wages over time. And then the U.S. has the six highest real wages in the world. They're behind Denmark, Australia, Sweden, Norway, and Luxembourg. So as of 2020, 11.4 Americans live below the poverty line. There are approximately 37.2 million Americans living in poverty. The poverty rate for households in the U.S. is 4.7%. And from 2010 to 2019, the poverty rate steadily dropped from 15.1% to 10.5%. 
However, there was a sharp uptick from 2019 to 2020 when it increased to 11.4%. So, okay, 52% of Americans are considered middle class, while 29% are considered lower class and the smallest percent, 19%, are considered upper class. So middle class constitutes any income between 42,000 and 126,000. The top 10% earn 30.2% of the total income in the US, whereas the bottom 90% earn 69.8% of the total income. And so there's like obviously a huge divide there. Okay. So from 2014 to 2020, the average median household income increased from $55,613 to $67,521. And then from 2014 to 2020, the real median income raised by 13%. Wages are expected to grow by 3% between 2021 and 2022. Unfortunately, this number doesn't keep up with inflation, which has grown by 6.2% in 2021 and is expected to grow further in 2022. In fact, overall wage growth hasn't strayed much further from 3% in several years, despite inflation. So here, I'm just going to show this. I'm not going to show all the numbers, but the average American income by state, blue is the highest and red, dark red is the lowest. Median household income gives us a picture of what the typical household actually earns over the course of a year. So here's some highlights of income in the U.S. So these numbers might be a little slightly different, it looks like. Uh, real median household income was $70,784 in 2021, not statistically different from the 2020 estimate of $71,186. Based on the Money Income Gini Index, income inequality increased by 1.2 percent between 2020 and 2021. This represents the first time in the Gini Index has shown it as an annual increase since 2011. Between 2020 and 2021, the change in the number of total workers is not statistically different. However, there was an increase of about 11.1 million full-time year-round workers from approximately 106.3 million to 117.4 million, suggesting a shift from working part-time or part-year in 2020 to full-time year-round work in 2021. The real median earnings of all workers, including part-time and full-time workers, increased 4.6% between 2020 and 2021, while median earnings of those who work full-time year-round decreased 4.1%. Real median post-tax household income in 2021 was not statistically different from 2020. In contrast to the 1.2% increase in the Gini index using pre-tax income between 2020 and 2021, the annual percent change in the Gini index calculated by post-tax income was not statistically different. Next, let's look at the cost of living. So let's look at some budgeting stuff. All right, so we've got a median in household income of $63,179 or, or $5,264 a month. $23,000 is the average amount millennials have saved for retirement. That's surprising. I don't have anything saved for retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. So $1,709, average total monthly cost for housing, including property taxes. $295,300 median home price as of June 2020, 34.62 average portion of total income spent on housing, $59,060 median down payment for homes nationwide as of June 2020. So we've got $550 for a new car payment, $333 for ride sharing services, $176 for gasoline and fuel costs, and $119 for car insurance payment. So we have an increase in health care. In 2015, it was $362 per month for health care. In 2018, it's $414 per month. That's a 14.7% increase in 
just about three years. So child care. $453 is the average monthly cost per child for full-time infant daycare in Mississippi, the least expensive state. In the most expensive state, Massachusetts, it is $1,743. Other things we spend on each month on average. Groceries and dining, $660. Subscription services, $237. Clothing and shoes, $155. Cell phone bill is $94 and $58 for a gym membership fee. So, all right. A monthly budget for someone making $7.25 an hour, working 40 hours a week, is $1,160. And the monthly budget for someone on $15 an hour wage is $2,400. But to maintain the monthly budget we've mentioned, uh, that would be $4,140 a month or $49,680 yearly. This is not including the child care. So even a $15 an hour wage isn't high enough anymore. And well, sure, people may now be claiming that minimum wage wasn't meant for people to live off of, but is that statement or is their claim true? Well, let's start with what was the purpose of the minimum wage? So the purpose of the minimum wage was to stabilize the post-depression economy and protect the workers and the labor force. The minimum wage was designed to create a minimum standard of living to protect the health and well-being of employees. As mentioned earlier, the establishment of a minimum wage first occurred in 1938 with the passing of the Fair Labor Standards Act. This act ensured that employees should be paid a minimum amount for the labor they perform and was passed to prevent employers from paying their workers next to nothing for long hours and often dangerous working conditions. From its inception, the minimum wage was meant to be a living wage. Families should be able to live off of the pay comfortably rather than struggling paycheck to paycheck. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a major proponent of the living wage, saying that by living wages, I mean more than a bare subsistence level. I mean the wages of a decent living. Well, now you may be thinking the minimum wage has been increased, so they're fine. But has it been enough? While worker productivity has risen over the years, growth of real wages and income has been slow or stagnant for most working people for most of the last four decades. Low-wage workers saw their wages rise only 3.3%, median workers saw their wages rise 15.1%, and lo and behold, high-wage workers saw their wages rise 60 3.2% in the last four decades through 2019. And let's not forget about our friend inflation. People paid the federal minimum wage have seen a 30% fall in an inflation adjusted earnings over the last 50 years. So Americans suffer pay cuts as inflation rises. We're going to look at some statistics. So Americans suffer pay cut as inflation outpaces wage growth. Year over year change in real and nominal earnings and the consumer price index of the US. So the orange line is the consumer price index. The blue line is the average hourly earnings. And the green line, the green bar rather, is the real average hourly earnings. So earnings for all employees on private and non-farm payroll, seasonally adjusted. So basically, this means that inflation is rising faster than our wages are, if I'm going to sum it up. And salary increases do not keep up with inflation. Let's see what Forbes has to say about it. Well, there's been a, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported a 7.9% increase in the consumer price index. The overall average salary increase over the same time period was 3.4% which is less than half the current inflation rate. Inflation and salary increases are not the same. Well, that's one reason. Another, so wages are sticky. 
Um, wage increases are sticky, meaning they tend not to go down unless significant structural issues are present. Because wages are difficult to reduce if markets deteriorate, companies are slow to raise wages before determining long-term implications. While layoffs and, so during COVID, while layoffs and lower annual bonuses reduced aggregate compensation levels, the salaries of remaining employees did not decrease. Okay, reason number three, pre-pandemic salary budgets already began to reflect labor market demographic changes. Job changes, the rise in starting salaries and benefits do not appear in annual salary budgets. Companies are investing in flexible employee programs and culture to su supplement fixed pay. Those are the five reasons Forbes gave. So it seems pretty clear that unfortunately, a lot of Americans may fall under the definition of being a wage slave. But that doesn't mean there aren't things we can do to help change the system for better, to make it better, a better system for everyone. So first, we're going to start with unions. So I have some information, and then I also have some statistics from the EPI, which is the Economic Policy Institute. So first, there, I just... I'll read their overall, I guess, statistics, and then I'm going to go a little more in-depth on some of them. But, so, what unions help with. So, unions can help with income and economic protections. So, they found that, on average, the 17 U.S. states with the highest union densities have state minimum wages that are, on average, 19% higher than the national average and 40% higher than those in low union density states have median annual income $6,000 higher than the national average and have higher than average unemployment insurance recipiency rates. That is a higher share of those who are unemployed actually receive unemployment insurance. For health and personal well-being, they found that states with the highest union densities have an uninsured, those without health insurance, population 4.5 percentage points lower on average than that of low union density states. They have all elected to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, protecting their residents from falling into the coverage gap, and are more likely to have passed paid sick leave laws and paid family and medical leave laws than states with lower union densities. And then democracy, how unions can help democracy. They found that there were significantly fewer restrictive voting laws being passed in the 17 highest union density states than in the middle 17 states, including D.C. and the 17 lowest union density states. And over 70 percent of low union density states passed at least one voter suppression law between 2011 and 2019. And then also from the EPI, here's just a map that shows unionization varies widely by state so it just kind of gives you union density by state and then low medium high and then so i just have so why do unions help they promote economic equality and build worker power and they can help workers win increases in pay better benefits and safer working conditions and they not only benefit the workers who are in those unions, but also their communities. In communities with unions, you can find positive economic health and democratic outcomes, as we found with the EPI. And they also can help non-union workers too. By setting better standards of working conditions, it will encourage the non-union employers to meet those same standards if they want to attract and retain the workers they need. So how do they help with the wages? We kind of went over that the high union density states had an average median income about $6,000 higher than the national average. Low union density states had an average median income about $6,500 lower. Union workers earned about 10.2% more in wages when compared to non-union workers. And unions may potentially help with the gender and racial slash ethnic wage gaps. So women's pay was about 4.7% higher in a union compared to a non-union worker. Black workers made about 13.1% more compared to non-union, and Hispanic workers 
were paid about 18.8% more, again, compared to non-unions. Yeah. So then I just have two more pictures, again, from the EPI. So the average state minimum wage is 40% higher in high union density states than in low union density states, as we can see here. And then median household incomes in high union density states are more than $12,000 higher on average than median incomes in low union density states, again, as we can see here. So then the next thing is how can unions help with health care? Well, more than 9 in 10 unionized workers have access to employer-sponsored health benefits. And union employees, employers contribute more to their employees' health care benefits. And again, from the EPI, we just have another kind of figure here that shows residents of high union densities states are more likely to have health insurance. And then one more. How, what other benefits can unions potentially help with? Union employees are more likely to offer employers are more likely to offer retirement plans and to contribute more towards those plans and union workers are more likely to have paid sick days vacation and holidays more input into the number of hours they work and more predictable schedules and again we just have a picture here that shows high union density states are more likely to have passed paid leave laws and then I also have one here that just kind of shows, as we mentioned earlier, that voter restriction bills are more likely to pass in low union density states than in high union density states. So, as we can see, unions could be an effective way to fight wage slavery by increasing wages, providing better working conditions and benefits, as well as helping the communities as a whole. So, what about worker cooperatives? Well, what is a worker cooperative? A worker cooperative is a values-driven business that puts worker and community benefit at the core of its purpose. Uh, they help workers feel more in control. And some will say that worker co-ops simply do not work as functioning businesses, but worker co-ops have shown significant growth in the latest survey data, according to 50, B 50, 50 by 50. Let's see. Worker cooperatives have grown in number of both enterprises and locations since 2015. So, okay. The racial demographic of worker owners continue to show a majority of people of color with a concentration of Latino workers. I say Latina, not Latinx. Um, so there's it's about 41% white, 37% Latina, uh, 12 or about 13% black and 6.2% other. And as for gender, people identifying as female continue to make up the majority of the workforce at worker cooperatives. So there's 62.5% female, about 36% male, and about 2% non binary. So here are some key data points. So this was. Uh, it was, two organizations had just released the latest findings in the 2019 Worker Cooperative State of the Sector Report, analyzing data collected from 2018 and deepening collective understanding of the sector in several ways. So the key points, the survey verified 465 worker cooperatives. This is the largest number of worker cooperatives our annual census has verified to date. To be successfully verified, a business must be incorporated, have at least three worker owners, have at least 50% worker ownership, and have completed a full year of business operation. Firms that do not meet these requirements are not included in the 465, and as such, we consider this to be a conservative count. Based on our work in the field and close partnerships across the country, we estimate the number of worker cooperatives operating at the time of the survey to be closer to 800 when non-verified enterprises are included in the count. So our count represents 35.7% net growth in verified worker cooperatives since 2013 and 5.1% growth in the net total number of verified enterprises from the previous year. The verified worker cooperative employed, cooperatives employed 6,454 workers in 2018, producing about $505 million in revenue. 
Consistent with last year's State of the Sector report, participating workplaces reported an average top to bottom pay ratio of two to one. This pay ratio is in stark contrast to the average pay ratio of traditionally structured businesses, which sits at 303 to one. Worker cooperatives pay equity or sorry, worker cooperatives pay equity is a reflection of democratic workplaces prioritizing worker benefit from business success as opposed to shareholder executive benefit from business success. And another thing we can do is create a livable wage. So we're going to look at another article, or sorry, yeah, this article about protecting low wage workers from inflation from the EPI, Economic Policy Institute. All right, so faster inflation makes it more important, not less to raise the federal minimum wage. Every year lawmakers don't raise the minimum wage is a year that they have effectively cut the purchasing power and living standards of this country's lowest wage workers. Even under a worst case inflation scenario where every penny and extra pay that results from moving the federal minimum wage by to fifteen dollars an hour by twenty twenty seven is passed on in the form of higher prices, the result would be a five year stretch of inflationary pressure to equal to zero point one percent per year, or about one one hundredth of the increase we've seen since twenty twenty one. Then the inflationary effect would return to zero. Even if even this extremely mild inflation could be substantially blunted by other margins of adjustment to a higher minimum wage, including a retreat from today's still sky high profit margins. During normal times, profits account for about 13% of the price of goods and services. But since recovery from COVID-19 recession began in the second quarter, second quarter of 2020, rising profit margins have accounted for roughly 40% of the rise in prices. When these margins normalize, they will there will be ample room for non-inflationary wage growth. So faster inflation makes it more important to raise the minimum wage. Minimum wage increases have trivial, trivial effects on inflation. Other margins, particularly corporate profits, can absorb this small price pressure. Laws that increase the state's minimum wage directly boost the pay of the lowest paid workers who too often have little bargaining power by effectively shifting the wage negotiation between employer and worker to one between employers and community. And some other potential options because as we know being a wage slave means that you're forced to work so how could like how could we make it to where people can have more of a choice in what they do for work and what would that be one potential thing meeting the basic needs of people wow who would have guessed so one thing is we can lower cost of living because, and that just kind of, and I would say deals with inflation and just getting inflation under control. And obviously we need to watch for price gouging too, because when corporate profits are high and everyone else is suffering, there's a problem there. Yes. Yeah, so one might call it an inequality almost. Yeah. Another option that we thought of was UBI, because again, with UBI, it would give people the chance to take some time off and not be worrying, worried about being forced into poverty so they could actually figure out what it is they want to do and how best they feel they can contribute to society as a whole. And then another option that we thought of was Medicare for All, which we kind of talked about in our healthcare episode. But that, again, because we know that another reason that people are concerned about quitting their jobs is losing healthcare coverage. So, how can we solve that? Exactly. Medicare for All is a potential solution to make it to where our healthcare coverage is not tied to our jobs so that our employers are not dictating whether or not we have health care. Yeah, so while a lot of Americans may be considered wage slaves, whether they would want to admit it or not, there are potential solutions we can do to help us not be slaves to our jobs and also have more power and say in our lives again. More freedom, which is what America as a nation should stand for. 
yeah, so those are just some of our possible solutions. And obviously there's probably more that people could think of too. But those are some of the ones that we thought of and provided some information to support the fact that they could help. So the first video mm -hmm. we, well, well, our overall topic was wage slavery today. And the first video that we did was, what is it? Where we just kind of went over what is wage slavery and some of the thoughts on the term wage slavery in the past. So I guess the one thing that I thought of while we were going over that is the proponents of wage slavery probably... So the proponents of wage slavery being bad. So the people who were for like the term wage slavery being like a negative probably only made those claims or had that belief in an attempt to justify chattel slavery when really the goal should have been to abolish both wage slavery and chattel slavery in my opinion like neither should have yeah. really prevailed all right i guess like we technically did abolish chattel but then there's like still in prison how you can so we didn't get rid of and i mean i would still argue there's wage slavery still so i we haven't really gotten rid of slavery as a whole i guess yeah and i really like the frederick Douglass quote we read i'm not going to read the whole thing again because it's really <laughs> long but basically frederick Douglass, former slave and abolitionist um he basically was saying that um so he was a chattel slave and then he was a wage slave and in his opinion, being a wage slave was only slightly better than being in chattel slavery. Uh, it was just as degrading. You had just as little power, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And it just puts you at the mercy because you're just at the mercy of your employer, basically. Yeah. The capitalist owning class. Yes. The bourgeois. <laughs> They're bougie. <laughs> And then in our next video, we went over how it affects us in the U.S. With that, the some things that I thought of were obviously by looking at salaries and income. And then when we looked at the budgeting and cost of living, I'd wager we are wage slaves because it's, I would say, what was the median again? I think like 70,000, 60,000, something like that. It was that. around, around, around 70,000, a little bit more or less. Okay. Depending on what numbers you're looking at. And the cost of living, it, and obviously with inflation, even right now, I think, I don't know the most recent to this date, the airing of this video, how, how inflation, I don't, I think I've heard it's maybe going down a little bit. I've heard like up and down, but either way, even without inflation, I don't think a lot of people have had savings or time to save and really to me the biggest thing that confirms to me that we're wage slaves is the fact that a majority of us cannot quit our job or else we will become homeless yes lose our health care just have a poor quality of life yeah so that means we have to work so to me that just makes it like there's no freedom there like we don't have the freedom to not work unless you want a poor quality of life which is terrible like that's not right. how it should be because there's more you can contribute to the world than a profit you oh know, yeah. there's so many things you can contribute you can contribute art and music you can contribute scientific and you contribute innovation scientific discovery like all of these things, you know, you can have a therapeutic contribution to the world. Like there's just so many things you can do for the world that aren't driven by profit. And so this myth that you have to work in order to contribute to society, like, I mean, yes, working to contribute to society isn't a bad thing or anything. You know, I'm not against doing that, but it shouldn't be the only choice. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, it also comes down to the fact that the business owner who generally 
if I'm going to be honest, isn't really doing much of anything. Like, sure, they started the business and they deserve credit for that. But now their workers are the ones who are doing all the work for them, making them that money. Yet they're taking a huge percentage of that profit. Right. That is the, wrong. Like the ownership to labor, um, the ratio of their payment for a standard business is like 303 to one, which is ridiculous. Yeah, that's the, tell me how that's fair. I right. want people to tell me and justify how that is fair. Yes. And like, don't give me the excuse that, well, they came up with the idea because anybody can come up with a business idea. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's not rocket science. Sorry, it's not. Yeah. And like, we're I'm not, not saying they don't deserve to get paid because no, they're doing somewhere. Yes. But not to the extent that they're getting paid. That's just way too much. That's greed, pure greed. And then another thing, obviously, the 14.7% increase in healthcare. That's a joke. Like, what? Healthcare has not gotten any better. And then they just are going to say inflation. But, well, A, insurance premiums aren't paying for the increase in supply. I mean, I get that. Yes, that means that if I go to the hospital, my stay is going to cost more. So maybe that extra cost will get pushed onto the insurance company. But I highly doubt the insurance company is even paying for that. They're going to push that onto me. And the, yet they're going to increase my health insurance premium and push that extra cost onto me. Right. It, it kind of feels like what's the point of health insurance sometimes. Yeah, it's just a joke. It's all greed is a very uh, big problem in America. I mean, it's probably a big problem nationwide, but I live in America, so that's where I experience it. Yeah. And then another thing. Oh, what is this one? Oh, I guess I was going to ask you, what do you think is the reason wages aren't increasing? I mean, yeah, I agree. I think it's just, I think it's a lot of greed. Um, I think it's a lot of people at the top who have all of the control, keeping all the wealth for themselves. Uh, I think wages haven't increased because, I mean, they, well, yeah, minimum wage hasn't even increased in like over 10 years, I think. I think it's been like, what, what year did they raise it to 725? Uh, let me look that up quick. Because I know since it's passing, it's only been raised nine times, I think, is what... Yeah, that was something I thought was crazy. Like, <laughs> over, like, that many years, only nine times, like, you would think at least one time every ten years or something, you know? Yeah, especially when we looked at inflation and how inflate like, it's, it's, it's just a joke. Yeah. Sorry, America just seems like a joke right now. It, it kind of is. Um, Congress hasn't increased the minimum wage since 2009 when it went from $6.55 to $7.25. What a joke. It's so Are you ridiculous. serious? How, 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 There's what 20 is that? states where the minimum wage is $7.25. That wasn't even a dollar. No. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, I bet the, the owning class lost so much with that dollar. Yeah. Oh. Even though profits are at record highs. Mm -hmm. But they can't increase the wages, y'all, without increasing the prices somehow. Yeah, I am very much against. They do not need to push that cost onto the consumer. That cost yeah. is... We're... I have some info on wealth inequality and how it's dangerous for tomorrow's episodes. But oof, that wealth inequality just gets to me because it's a joke. Yeah. But otherwise, with how it affects us, yeah, just money. We, And we do not have the bargaining power, too. So that also, in my right. opinion, makes us wage slaves because we don't have Absolutely. any say over our hours. We don't really have any say over our pay. We're at the mercy. Even if you get paid a decent wage and make maybe more than the most average, Amer the median American income, you're still at the mercy of your boss. Right, like go into McDon go apply for a job at McDonald's, go to the interview and ask for twenty dollars an hour for a line cook job and see what happens. You know, that that's not gonna happen. You don't have any negoti you might have a negotiating power within like maybe a dollar at most of your wage, if even that. 
Like, like there's no negotiating power. And even then, that negotiating power, they already have pre-built in. Like, they pretend that you have that negotiating power, but they already planned that, you know? Right, they already have that in the budget. Yes. Like, you you know, they don't have to, like, they don't, they're not going to let you change your wage and have to adjust their budget. Exactly. Like most companies I've seen will have a range of what they'll pay new hires. And I've even seen people where they were like the new hire didn't ask for a lot. So they asked on the lower end. So they went with the lower end. Oh yeah. Of course they're going to do that. That's so messed up though. But yeah, they could have paid that employee so much more, but Oh, that is a, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. I could never those business owners do not uh that is so unethical that's disgusting but yeah so we talked about how it affects us and clearly it does and then we went over like what can be done we talked about unions and obviously unions are important yes. they just help with a bunch of different things talked about workers co-ops um creating a living wage meeting basic needs which we've mentioned multiple times we just need to do that because it's ridiculous that we don't we can afford to meet the basic needs of every american in this country yet we choose not to yes oh it's just frustrating to think about it is but yeah that was kind of, I guess I, that was kind of wage slavery. Yeah. I don't have any thing else to really add to it. I don't either. So make sure you join us tomorrow where we talk about the economy and modern monetary theory. Otherwise, leave a comment below letting us know what you want us to talk about in future episodes you can reach out to us on facebook instagram tiktok twitter youtube we also do occasionally twitch live streams so watch out for us there and don't forget to like follow or subscribe and turn on notifications so that you know when we do otherwise we will see everyone next time